Well, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for pointing out the obvious that being a dean is more difficult than dealing with North Koreans. Uh, uh, the faculty, they don't have nuclear weapons that I'm aware of, but they are masters in asymmetrical warfare. And so it, it does, it is a, it is a challenge. Um, and, and thank you for holding up my, my book. Um, you know, selling books is a shameless business. And, uh, I just had no idea, you know, my, my wife, Julie, who's in Florida right now, but she, uh, she tweets every day on something about my book and puts it in Facebook. And I don't have a Twitter account. And I sure don't have a uh, Facebook account, but she does that because she said, you got to get your book out there. And uh, I sort of, um, old fashioned guy, I sort of hope that sort of word of mouth will be, will be enough, uh, but it probably isn't. But. Uh, I should mention, uh, I never thought I'd write a book. I, um, I never wrote anything in the government. I was in the government for 33 years, and I never wrote anything longer than two pages. And so um, when some people suggest, including my wife, Julie, uh, when she suggests something, it's not in the form of a question. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I try to push back by saying, look, you know, I don't think anyone's really interested in a two-page book. And, uh, <laughs> And so she encouraged me. She said, just tell your stories. And so I said, OK, I don't know if it'll come together in a book. But I, I remember I got on to page three, which is sort of terra incognita. And, uh, and I, I said to Julie, I said, hey, I think I'm on my way here. You know, I got on page four and five. And I felt sort of like that Forrest Gump uh, character. You know, that I kept going and going and going. And uh, finally, I stopped on page 401. And, uh, and uh, along the way, I mean, I, I, I would tell stories. I mean, I'd write something. And they were stories that I think had a purpose and had a point in terms of describing our country's diplomacy overseas, the fact that no one is indifferent to the United States. They may not like us. They may like us, but they're certainly not indifferent. So I thought it was important for people to understand that. And then as I, as I kind of kept writing, I, I realized I could kind of put this uh, stuff together. And it really, um, you know, even Julie said it made sense. So I was, uh, <laughs> felt, felt, very, um, felt very positive about it, finally. And, um, and as I wrote it, I, I sort of thought to myself that maybe, you know, our country needs to understand that whether we like it or not, we're kind of it. And for people who think that China, that, you know, we now live in this uh, century of China, you know, my suggestion, um, you know, go to China and tell yourself that these people uh, are really going to spend time on dealing with, uh, with uh, you know, Ebola in Africa or dealing with, uh, you know, uh, drug wars in Latin America or going to be dealing with the, the myriad of problems in the Middle East, let alone the, uh, the issues of dealing with Putin's Russia. China is not looking for global leadership. And not that we ever did either, but I think we're, we're going to have to do it better than we've done. I mean, I don't think any American uh, gets up as the rest of the world thinks we get up in the morning saying, well, you know, who can we dominate today? I mean, it's just not the way we look at things. I mean, I'm from Little Compton, Rhode Island. I assure you no one in Little Compton, Rhode Island ever woke up saying we've got to dominate the world. Uh, and, and yet, I think, and we've seen this time and time again through the decades and now over a century, that our country is really the country that is very much looked to. And so I think um, we need to do diplomacy a lot better uh, than we've done it in the past. And it's not to say that American diplomacy is one of those oxymorons or something. I mean, I think we are pretty good at this. But I think to a great extent, our country, we need to kind of get back or get away from the sort of finger wagging we do at every at everyone and instead start first of all start with a very clear understanding of what our interests are and why we need to engage in these issues and then find practical means forward find practical ways that people can somehow manage to live together uh, going forward when I um, think back to the um, to the uh, well, frankly, I mean, when I think about the this, uh, you know, what our president is going to, what the new president, uh, whoever that is, uh, 
I'm not going to get into that. I've never interfered in the internal affairs of another country, including my own. So, uh, but uh, you know, there are there are a lot of issues out there, and you know, one of my favorite quotes is. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Poland on a couple of iterations, and uh, uh, before my time, there was a party, uh, Polish uh, Communist Party first secretary, guy whose name is probably otherwise lost to history, named Władysław Gomułka. And uh, Władysław Gomułka was famous for giving very long speeches and not particularly successful metaphors. And one day, he stood up in front of a big crowd in Kraków and said, comrades, this was in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, comrades, just a few years ago, our fatherland stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I'm here to tell you today, comrades, that we have taken an important step forward. And so, <laughs> I, so, I think as we, as we look forward, I think we have to step back. And, uh, and I think uh, we need to look at, you know, what are these issues that we're going to be dealing with? How are we going to manage these issues? You know, some of them are, um, some of them are just annuals. You know, they, they'll come up and you'll, you know, they'll end at some point. And then some are sort of hardy perennials. And uh, every year you're going to have to be dealing with them. And they're, they're really nothing, nothing new. But certainly, I think one of the hardy perennials we're going to have to deal with is this precisely this question of China. Uh, there are those who fear that China is somehow, you know, trying to position itself to uh, uh, to grab the uh, sort of mantle of world leadership. But I think people who know China a little better look at China and see a country that is so beset by its internal problems that these internal problems it is having are beginning to spill over into a foreign policy. And we need to be careful, and we need to be vigilant, and we need to be firm in dealing with the, uh, with, with the Chinese. You know, show me a superpower that's misbehaving overseas, and I'll show you a superpower that's experiencing problems internally. And when you look at what China is dealing with, its whole northwestern part with it, where it's a Muslim area, these Uyghurs, uh, and uh, the, the difficulty of making Uyghurs, Muslim minority, feel a part of the, uh, of the rest of, uh, of China, you know, this Han minority, um, the Han majority, the Chinese that, who are, uh, you know, have no Muslim traditions. So making these Uyghurs feel a part of China as opposed to continuing what many of them have done, which is get into Islamic terrorism. Now, there are many Chinese who say, look, uh, let's face it, Uyghurs can't be choosers. And so they have, to, they have to be a part of us, whether they like it or not. There's a serious problem there. There's a serious problem with Tibetans. And more fundamentally, there's a serious problem in China with the whole question of do they have a government structure which is based on this Communist Party idea, the leading role of the Communist Party. Is that government structure really appropriate to the economic um, uh, facilities, the, econo the economy, really, that they're, that they're building? And I think many Chinese have come to the conclusion, no, we can't have this third-rate political system running what we hope will be a first-rate economy. And already they're seeing that economy slow down. There are too many tendencies of central planning, of control. So we're seeing a China that is increasingly concerned that they've gotten this far with their export-oriented economy, but they are in something that an economist would call a middle-income trap, where the uh, incomes are not really growing, and yet their competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other countries producing textiles and human hair wigs and uh, you know Halloween toys and things like that. Uh, Halloween toys in China are 100% export item. Uh, Chinese have no need for green goblins. And so when they look at this kind of stuff, they realize that they could lose whole factories of this to places in, in Vietnam and elsewhere. So I think China has the real concern we should have about China is the failure to kind of move on into a next phase will weaken China. And I would argue that a weak China is more dangerous to us 
than a strong China. Strong China has confidence in the future, confidence in its institutions, confidence in the direction it's going. A weak China is one that's quite the opposite. And when a country is weak, when there are problems internally, you'll see more problems externally. So I don't consider the, the, the uh, mistakes that China has made in dealing with uh, their Southeast Asian neighbors in this place called the South China Sea, which uh, the Chinese government seems to insist on it becoming a southern Chinese lake. I don't see those mistakes that they're making in dealing with the Philippines and dealing with Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, et cetera. Those mistakes are not caused by by uh, strength, they're caused by by weakness, by the government's need to show a disenfranchised and uh, and skeptical public that hey, we're protecting China's uh, nationalism and China's honor. So these kinds of trends, we really need to be on top of. I think we need to very much, with the Chinese, look for what I would call patterns of cooperation. We need to find areas where we can really work with them. And uh, if we can find those patterns of cooperation, work with China, I think uh, we can kind of build some level of trust, build some uh, confidence that they might have in the relationship with us, and I think go forward in a better way. After all, I think China, um, and the U.S.-China relationship is truly a relationship that is uh, too big to fail. I mean, we cannot allow it to fail. At the same time, we cannot be uh, uh, ignoring China or, chi or allowing China to get its way, whether it's with our, our friends and allies in Southeast Asia or elsewhere. China, I think one of the places where we should really work very closely with the Chinese is a country where we have grown to understand that we really do co have common interests, and that is with uh, dealing with the North Korean nuclear threat. China has no interest whatsoever in North Korea joining a nuclear club. China also realizes, finally, that we're not going to put up with it. That is, we're not going to say, well, what can we do? They're, they have the nuclear, uh, the fissile material, they've exploded devices or building missiles. We should just accept the inevitable and make North Korea a nuclear club. We can't do that, and we can't do that because we cannot expect South Korea to uh, just sit there and allow North Korea to become a nuclear state, nor would Japan sit there and allow North Korea to be a nuclear state. And so we are doing all we can to buttress the defense of those two treaty allies of ours. For example, we are not only exercising, and we do it every year, much to the consternation of the North Koreans, we not only exercise for how we would flow in hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops if necessary in, in a uh, repeat of uh, 1950, we are also now talking to, the North, talking to the South Koreans about putting up some very modern uh, anti-ballistic missile systems one of which uh, hits the ballistic missile at its so-called terminal high phase. This is so-called THAAD system. This is state-of-the-art stuff that we're bringing in there. And if you're China, you're saying, well, wait a minute, are you really that worried about North Korea or are you coming after us? Because we see the deployment of a high-tech anti-ballistic missile system that is going to make our system, the Chinese system, obsolete. And they have a point except that, no, we're not doing this because of the Chinese. We're doing this because we have allies, and we have a treaty obligation to protect those allies, and we'd rather do it that way than have to start a, uh, than have to flow in hundreds of thousands of forces. So why, so the Chinese are looking at this, and they realize this North Korea problem is not going to go away on its own. So why do the Chinese keep supporting North Korea? Now, if you read articles in the U.S. press, you'll read that somehow uh, the Chinese are worried, well, what if North Korea uh, collapses and then everyone uh, in North Korea moves up over the Yalu River and uh, you know, moves into China, and this could be very destabilizing in China? Well, first of all, there are 22 million North Koreans. There are 1.4 billion Chinese. And if the state of North Korean compass making was that bad that everyone went north instead of where they probably want to go, which is south, 
I still think China could absorb it. Wouldn't be fun, but I think they could absorb it. So I would submit to you that there's something else going on there. And the something else is not just that they're worried about refugees. It's they're worried there's a lot of sort of zero-sum thinking in China. After all, if North Korea goes down, that's a victory for the US model, South Korea, because South Korea would be the successor state, defeat for the Chinese model, North Korea. So there it is in black and white. Uh, America wins, China loses. It's very much a zero-sum game. Now, if this were just an intellectual parlor game, that would be OK. But in, within China, there's a real push and pull right now between people who say the whole darn system ought to be junked, and then the people who say, like Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping the Chinese leader, says, no, the whole system doesn't have to be changed. We just need to tinker with the, around the edges, et cetera. So this is a very delicate uh, um, debate and rather raucous debate within China about the future of uh, China's political system. So if the Marxist-Leninist client state of theirs goes down, how would that affect China's internal debate? It would have some impact that no one really knows yet, and the Chinese don't want to deal with that kind of internal political stability. One thing we need to understand a little better is when we look at a country like North Korea, even when we look at a country like Mexico on our border, we consider that foreign affairs. But when China, who comes out of a very different cultural experience, when they look at neighbors, they don't think of them as, as sovereigns out there, just like the Chinese, all sort of born through the, uh, through the uh, Treaty of uh, Westphalia, the concept of sovereignty uh, honed during the, uh, 18th, uh, during the 1800s. For the Chinese, they look at these as tributary states. In short, they look at them as part of their own civilization. So they don't have the same view of sovereignty that we do. So they don't, they, they, when they see change in North Korea, they worry about what it could mean to them because they understand the organic relationship between what goes on in the Korean Peninsula and what goes on in China because they have a couple of thousand years to, uh, to digest of that. So the Chinese, I think, worry very much that change in North Korea could ultimately cause heightened tensions within China. And if you say, look, Chinese, we both win. This is win-win. And the Chinese will look at you because their idea of win-win is maybe a Burmese dissident. They don't really understand the concept of win-win. So in short, we need to do a much better job with the Chinese of showing to them what precisely we, how we would handle a North Korean demise. The United States has no interest in threatening Chinese security uh, interests by putting troops on the Yalu or uh, putting uh, CIA listening posts on the Yalu. We have no intention of uh, worsening China's uh, strategic position. And so I think we need to make that clear and show the Chinese what we would do and what we wouldn't do. One thing we would do is grab those nukes. I mean, we don't want the South Korean forces grabbing North Korea's fissile material. We don't want anyone grabbing it except us. And so we, I think most people, and I've talked to Chinese who surprisingly know some of this stuff, they know that we would want to send our own forces in there, very small teams, of which there would be many books and movies in the future, um, to grab the North Korean nuclear weapons before they are sold to any other party or taken by, uh, taken by someone else. We need to lay that out. The Chinese already know it. We might as well show it to them. So I think we need to do a much more of a deep dive with China and try to see if we can find a common language with the, um, with the Chinese on North Korea. China has no affection for Kim Jong-un. But China is, uh, they often take their inability to decide on something and turn it into, into some kind of uh, longer term strategy. Just as uh, I think in, in the Obama administration, frustrated by North Korea, announced that this was, uh, that the policy would be strategic patience. It's always good to put the word strategic in front of patience because patience alone you can't sell, but strategic patience, people go, oh, that's pretty smart. Uh, so that's the sort of thing the Chinese have been doing on North Korea. In fact, we shouldn't have much patience with North Korea. It's a very dangerous situation right now, and I think we need to really get on top of it, and I think our new president really needs to work with the Chinese on it. 
We have no interest in solving this problem by ourselves. We can't solve it by ourselves. But if we worked with the Chinese and found, I think, a higher level of trust, uh, uh, we could. You know, when I worked on this, we tried very hard to work in a negotiating framework with the Chinese, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Russians as well, and the U.S. to try through this six-party process to get the North Koreans to give up, uh, give up their fissile material, to shut down their reactor, in return for which we would give them some benefits, such as heavy fuel oil. Uh, and uh, it was not a lot of fun to do, but we managed these trade-offs and we calmed it down. In the summer of 2008, however, in the fall of 2008, the North Koreans were balking at going any further with it, mainly in the form that they would not allow us to do the verification, the inspections that we needed to do, and we insisted we needed to verify their, um, their facilities. And um, we, we essentially would not continue with the negotiations until we got the North Koreans to understand that. Kim Jong-il, who was the North Korean uh, president at the time, or the uh, dear leader at the time, uh, was um, incapacitated in the summer of 2008. So it was pretty clear they had leadership issues. Um, he, um, he ultimately uh, passed away a couple of years ago. And then uh, his son, Kim Jong-un, came along. Well, I never thought there could be a worse leader in the world than Kim Jong-il, <laughs> but I neglected to take account of his son. And so uh, Kim Jong-un has shown, unlike his father, he's shown zero interest in negotiation, zero interest in denuclearizing. And I think we need to come to terms with that. And if we're going to do that, we need to do it with the Chinese and together and see if we can, we can solve some of, these, some of these issues. So I think our president's really going to have to take the North Korea problem with the China problem and really take that folder out of the inbox and start, um, start really considering it because time is of the essence. Once they get a deliverable nuclear weapon, once they get solid fuel missiles, which they're rockets, which they are working on, that sounds like sort of inside baseball, liquid fuel versus solid fuel is a big difference because if you liquid fuel, you cannot put the fuel in the missile until it's ready to be launched. It's extremely flammable. So when you're watching North Korea, and we watch them day and night from outer space, from satellites, if they stand up a missile and start fueling it, you can tell you've got a few hours before uh, the missile will be ready to be launched. The trouble with solid fuel is they can, be, uh, they can be hiding in a forest, they come up and they fire off and you would have no time to uh, knock that missile off before it, uh, before it launches. And then you're counting on this THAAD system or some other high-tech uh, missile system to get them at the terminal velocity where they slow, well, at the termination of the boost phase and when they, before they've picked up speed and coming down. You know, um, Lockheed Martin thinks they can do it, but uh, uh, it would be easier to blast the thing on the on the pad. And right now, the North Koreans are moving to solid fuel. So we need to really ratchet up this uh, our attention to this, because otherwise, we're going to have a North Korea with a deliverable nuclear weapon and not a lot we can do about it. So I think um, time is of the essence. But that doesn't mean we can ignore the um, the Middle East and the problems that seem to get worse by the day. You know, when the Obama administration announced the, um, the pivot, I think it was understandable that we should try to spend more time on East Asia. After all, it's where our country's future is. It's where the economies are. That's where, uh, you know, our, uh, a lot of things are for us. So it, and I think the president was inspired by this idea that we're, we've entered a Pacific age, getting away from the Atlantic age. The trouble with it is it left the Middle East with a view that we didn't care anymore, that we were somehow uh, moving away from the Middle East. And, uh, and it left some of our European allies sort of wondering, oh, wait a minute, what happened to our you know, transatlantic relationship when you're off in Asia? Well, the fact is we never really went off to Asia. I mean, our Secretary of State today spends 10 times more time in uh, the Middle East and Europe than he does in, in Asia. But the damage was done. The impression that somehow we were more interested in uh, Asia than we were in the Middle East and, and Europe came at some critical times. In the Middle East, 
it came at a time of the Arab Spring or the Arab thing, whatever it will be called in history, because um, at that time, what we saw in the Middle East was in many countries a weakening of the state structures. A lot of reasons for this. In many countries, in many, many countries, these state structures, um, nation states had become very corrupt uh, and uh, uh, incapable of delivering the set of services that their populations expected. And so um, the, the states were essentially withering from, uh, from within and being toppled. And uh, there was a sort of sense that revolution was, in, was in, the, uh, in the air. But then what we found was that once you scrape off a corrupt and decayed uh, state structure, you don't, just, you don't expect to get a sort of uh, blooming flowers of democracy, what do you get? What you get is people saying, well, I can't rely on the state anymore. I have to take refuge in other forms of, uh, of protection. And so what we found was people became more sectarian than, and more Islamicized than ever before. They took refuge in their tribe. They took refuge in their, in their um, sect, that is, whether uh, Shia or Sunni. And we found that these countries not only became weakened because their, you know, uh, their governments had been toppled, they became weakened still because what emerged were these uh, very religious, uh, religiously inclined groups. Now, there were optimists who said, well, look, once the Muslim Brotherhood gets into power in Egypt, uh, they'll start behaving as a normal country. They'll have inboxes to worry about and growth problems and dealing with potholes in the roads, et cetera. No, they wouldn't. Then, and that's not what happened. They took a much greater interest in Islamicizing a secular state like Egypt. And so meanwhile, of course, many people in the Middle East who you know, complained day and night about the U.S. as a, uh, you know, and all the bad things they feel that we've done in the Middle East, somehow they wanted more of us. It's sort of like the old joke about the uh, Woody Allen joke about the restaurant, you know, the two problems with that restaurant, the food is terrible, and besides the portions are too small. That is, <laughs> they hated what we're telling them, but they wanted us to be there in, uh, in greater number and greater interest. So, so uh, there's been a lot of damage in the Middle East, and I'm not suggesting that the United States, we caused all the problems. Uh, you know, I think um, for many centuries, really, the Arabs have gotten away with the idea that it was someone else's fault. And whenever you hear a sort of national um, narrative, which always has someone else uh, tormenting them, at some point you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't you do something about that? And I think the Arabs uh, allowed a situation where the Turks were at fault, um, then the colonial powers were at fault, and then somehow corrupt dictators were at fault, but never themselves. So I think we have a part of the world which is, I think, beset by great difficulties in sort of charting its way and charting its way out of this, uh, out of this problem now. And I think the U.S. is going to have to play a, an important role in dealing with it. Um, I should say that, you know, traditionally, you had some regional powers who were real players in, uh, in dealing with these issues. You had the Turks. Um, and for better or worse, they helped kind of keep things under control in some of these, uh, um, in some of these places in the, in the Middle East. You had the uh, Egyptians. Uh, who were able to kind of go in there and help uh, arrange sort of political and diplomatic deals, solve problems, sometimes put in forces, but they could kind of handle it. And they would turn to the Saudis and say, could you pay the bill for this? And the Saudis did that. And then you, ha then you had Iran under the Shah, which was also interested in a, in a more peaceful Middle East. Well, now you have none of those elements. So uh, what you have is a Turkey that has really kind of shifted from what many of us understood Turkey to be, a sort of European Union wannabe, a country that ever since Ataturk's day had looked to a West and wanted to be, sort of yearned to be a part of that civilization. Now you have a Turkey that says, no, we're not interested in that anymore. And so whether it's neo-Ottomanism or sort of a new chauvinism, you have a Turkey that's much more interested in meddling uh, and not necessarily working with some of these Arab states and frankly causing more problems than they're, than they're solving. 
We have an Egypt that is totally uh, immersed in their internal problems, unable to play that diplomatic role that they played for many years. You know, for all the talk about getting rid of uh, Mubarak, I mean, Mubarak uh, kind of uh, made things run on time in Egypt. He, uh, you know, Lord knows there were serious problems there. He did, uh, he did not tackle the economic problems, and it, the state became more and more corrupt. But, um, you know, whenever you look at a dictator like that, the first question um, should not be, you know, how do we get rid of him? The first question should be, if he, if he was gone, who would replace him? And I think we've seen that Egypt is, to some extent, even worse off, as are some of the other countries that have undergone the, um, the, this uh, process in the Arab Spring. I mean, Libya may be getting some UN-approved government, but I wouldn't bet the mortgage on it. I think uh, Libya is going to be fraught with problems for years to come. So I think the U.S. has to be engaged in this, but I think we have to be engaged in a far more thoughtful way than we've been in the past. Uh, I would say, you know, as someone who served in Iraq, it was astounding to me the, the degree to which Americans did not understand the secular problem of Shia and Sunni. And, uh, you know, it's complicated, but, you know, it's not that complicated. Um, you can see where it started in the 7th century A.D. You can see that, like a lot of these issues, it was not continuous. It went into remission for centuries at a time. You can see where the uh, resurgence of it, and that was uh, in Saudi Arabia in the 18th century. You could see that coming up. You could see how the various tribal machinations in Saudi Arabia in the early 19th century where a number of Sunni tribes in Saudi Arabia escaped this very, um, very uh, Islamicized version of, of, uh, of, um, of worshiping, which was the, um, the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia, chased the more um, called the moderate Sunnis out. Many of them, those moderate Sunnis, went to places like Mosul in Iraq, actually in some cases became, uh, became Shia tribes. This history is all available, and I think we made very little effort to understand it. So what we have in Saudi Arabia is a country that is increasingly uh, very Wahhabi, and it's uh, extremely uh, religious, uh, Islamist. We have a uh, governing structure in, um, in Saudi Arabia that has not caused the country to modernize in a uh, cultural or sociological sense, although it has modernized considerably economically. But we've seen in, in Saudi Arabia a country that has been, to a great extent, the origin of some of these issues. And um, I think it's important to understand that it's within, it's not even just the Sunni Shia issue, the Iranians being a Shia country, Iraq being a Shia-led country, uh, Bahrain, for example, Shia-led, but the rest of the Arab world is Sunni. Uh, so what we saw, what we saw happen is that as, when the U.S. went into uh, to Iraq, it took a country that was 20% Sunni Arab. Now remember, the rest of the Arab world, 90% Sunni Arab. Iraq, the exception for a number of reasons having to do with the out-migration of tribes from Saudi Arabia over the centuries, Iraq being strangely some 60% Shia and only 20% Sunni with, you know, the other 20% and those are Kurds. So um, Iraq was really quite the exception. So for our leaders to say in 2003, we're going to go into Iraq, we're going to overthrow Saddam Hussein, we're going to put democratic government in there, and it's going to be an inspiration, the city, uh, shining city on the hill to the rest of the Arab world, simply was a statement that fabricated and uh, nurtured in complete ignorance. We did not understand that once you go in and give one person one vote in Iraq, they didn't split up into Democrats and Republicans. Well, I'm, I was going to say that would have been better, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> they, they didn't split up into political parties. They split up into Shia voted for Shia, Sunni voted for Sunni, and Kurds, believe me, always vote for Kurds. And so what did we end up getting in Iraq? We ended up getting a Shia-led country, the only one in the Arab Middle East. And so if you're Saudi Arabia 
and you have reasons for paranoia in the first place, uh, and you're kind of worried about Iran, and you're worried about whether Iran, with this under these ayatollahs since the early 80s, and whether they've been helping the Shia populations in the Arab world. You know that the Iranians have been helping the Shia group in southern Lebanon known as Hezbollah. You know that Iran has been hel helping these Shia, Shia groups in uh, Yemen, especially the Houthi. Uh, tribes. You know that Iran has been helping the Shia in the east province of Saudi Arabia, which is Shia majority province of Saudi Arabia, but also the main oil producing province of Saudi Arabia. And now suddenly you've got a whole Shia country on your northern frontier. You get a little grouchy. And so uh, we've been dealing with that problem from, from Iraq, for, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia for quite a while now. And it's not going to go away. They are very worried about how their neighborhood is, uh, is going. Now, we have, in the meantime, uh, in, in Iraq, there's no question the Shia living under the thumb of this Sunni minority were very pleased to take over. And they were not terribly magnanimous about reaching out to the uh, Sunni population. Now, if uh, to name one of their major uh, political leader is a guy named Nouri al-Maliki. If Maliki had been Nelson Mandela, and Nelson Mandela also had a 20% minority, and that 20% minority had also run his country for centuries, just as Maliki's 20% minority had run Iraq for centuries. But, but Nelson Mandela looked at that 20% uh, white South African population and tried to reach out to them. Said, Don't leave. Stay with us. Be a part of... Uh, be a part of uh, the new South Africa. Participate in the parliament. Be with us. And, um, and, you know, it didn't work perfectly. I mean, people who know South Africa know it's got a lot of problems. It worked a lot better than a lot of people uh, thought. So could Maliki have done that? Well, first of all, I submit to you that he's not Nelson Mandela. I, uh, I, I didn't know Nelson Mandela, but I can assure you he's not Nouri al-Maliki. Um, I can, Maliki, for example, I always say if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago because <laughs> I never saw any sign of it from him. So, no, he didn't reach out. He didn't reach out to the uh, Sunnis. But at the same time, and I think this is understudied in Iraq, because as Americans, we always say, well, why didn't you reach out? You know, that's what you know, you're supposed to do, and sort of magnanimous. We reached out to the Germans. We reached out to the Japanese. Why couldn't he do that to the Sunnis? You know, we always look at it in those terms. I think we've underappreciated the degree to which this 20% minority did not feel like being reached out to by the Shia. And so that is otherwise known as Sunni rejectionism. Now, why would a 20% minority feel so empowered, so emboldened that they can reject what the majority would say when they're only 20%? And by the way, it is true that the other 20%, that is the Kurds, are, tend to be Sunni. It is not true that the Sunni Kurds have anything in common with the Arab Sunnis. And if you look at, at the centuries, Sunni Kurds have always teamed up with Shia Arabs just an added complication. But when, when you hear some Sunnis say, well, you know, these, these uh, Shia, I mean, we're over 40% of the country. I mean, they should treat us with more respect. They're counting the Kurds, and they know that you can't really count the Kurds. So anyway, the, so the, um, the, this Sunni rejectionism so is hard to understand when they're 20% until you look at the rest of the Arab Middle East. And you see that Sunnis, 90%, all the way to Morocco, Sunnis are the dominant uh, sect in the, among the Arabs, a dominant sect in, in Islam. So even though they're the minority in Iraq, they don't think like a minority, they think like a majority. And I think that kind of mentality, we need to understand that kind of thing uh, a little better than we do. So some of the Sunnis, they went very radical and, of course, famously created the Sunni insurgency in um, 2006, 2005, 2006. Well, the trouble during this insurgency, um, the Sunnis, you, you had Saddamist Sunnis, that is, the, most of his army was Sunni, so they were all, uh, they all knew how to pick up arms. You had various Islamist Sunnis way out there in the villages. And, uh, you know, show me a, a Middle East village and I'll show you much stronger religious 
feelings than you get in a Middle East city for a lot of sociological reasons. So the Sunnis were um, very much susceptible to what was called at the time Al-Qaeda of Iraq, AQI. And, and so the Americans, we did a lot of good things. First of all, there was the surge. Now, the surge was not the wonder drug that some of its uh, uh, um, authors think it was, but it did help kind of go in and sort of lay down the law. If we're going to take a territory, we're, gonna, we're not going to take it and then move out that night. We're going to seize it. We're going to hold it. We're going to build on it. We're going to transfer it to the, to the Iraqis. So it's not the same. The surge was not the same as sort of American pacification in the Vietnam War, where we'd often go into a village, take things, and then move out again. It wasn't even like the strategic hamlet program in Vietnam, where we would take, some, take a, uh, uh, you know, a village and then try to protect the village. But the trouble was the village wasn't connected to anything else, and so eventually it also uh, was susceptible to Viet Cong attacks. The surge was supposed to be a much dynamic, uh, stronger vehicle. But I submit to you that those people who went around with ribbons on their chests, four-star generals claiming that this surge had solved all our problems in Iraq, failed to tell the rest of us what was really going on which was, yes, the surge was helpful, but there was another element, and it's, uh, it's as old as the wheel, uh, which was also invented in Iraq, by the way. And that was, you go to a sheikh, and you hold money in front of the sheikh, and you say, sheikh, I have some money. And if you want this money, you have to get your guys to stop shooting at our guys. If they keep shooting at our guys, we won't give you money. But we'll give you this money every month as long as your guys stop shooting at our guys. And of course, what they're looking for is for these Sunni-based militias to join in something called a uh, uh, Sons of Iraq or the Sahwa movement. And they, they ended up, uh, they took the money, they attacked the really radical elements, the Al-Qaeda, the radical Sunnis, and they essentially were loyal to the Shia-led government provided they got a check or not check, they wanted cash, uh, every, uh, uh, every month. So I get there in 2009, and I was told, well, we have now turned the, um, turned the uh, payment, uh, the Sons of Iraq payment program over to the government. And I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Is Maliki, you know, making the payments? Oh, you have to go in and tell them. So that's what I did my whole, uh, you know, 18 months there saying, did you pay the money? He said, well, um, it's, you have to check with the finance ministry. And I said, well, they haven't received the permission yet. Have you done it? And et cetera, et cetera. The point was, you, can, you can't buy a shake. You can rent one on a month-to-month -month <laughs> basis. And so anyone who wants to tell you that that war was won in 2006 because of the surge really is not being very honest about what the true dynamics of it. The Sunnis never accepted Shia rule, and the Shia never, uh, never uh, essentially forgave the Sunnis for their misrule of several centuries. So today, we have an even tougher and uh, nastier uh, Sunni uh, insurrection. And it was also fortified and, uh, and strengthened by, the, essentially, the meltdown in Syria. And that, of course, is uh, ISIS, or I think President Obama is the only person who calls it ISIL, but uh, uh, other people call it IS, Islamic State. But what it is, is a, uh, a move, it's a extremely radicalized Sunni movement who takes its inspiration from Wahhabism, even though if you're a Wahhabi in, in Saudi Arabia, you'd say, no, we don't uh, have anything to do with ISIS. We don't like them any more than you like them. And that is true and to a certain extent. But if you ask a Saudi, many Saudis, well, what do you really feel about this ISIS? They would say, look, we don't like them. We don't like their, their methods, their murderous people. And then they would pause and say, but at least someone's doing th something about these Shia. And that's the issue that we need to be aware of and we need to encourage to try to uh, make sure that Saudi Arabia can live with the fact that, as the president wisely said the other day, the Saudis are going to have to live with Iran because Iran is the, for, the, for many people, it's the strategic expression of Shia power. Um, 
no one is quite prepared to say the fact that the Shia run Iraq means that they have that Iraq is a power. It's not yet, and it probably won't be for a while. Iran is. I Iran is very definitely a power. So when you see right after the nuclear deal, and by the way, I think that was a smart thing to do. I am not saying that it was a great deal. Uh, I wish it were better, but I believe me, I've been in these things, and basically you ask for everything, and uh, the other guy asks for everything, and you kind of uh, you know, split the difference in the middle. That's sort of what happened. I think it bought us some necessary time. And you know, maybe this is a uh, sort of out there as a bet, but Ira Iran is a deeply divided society where I think there are many people, such as the Ir Ir Iranian foreign minister, Javed Zarif, who is also a graduate of the Corbell School at the University of Denver with a master's and PhD. So Javed Zarif is, represents that modernizer side of, Ir of Iran, wants Iran to join the world, understands that Iran shouldn't be a, uh, you know, try to make, be a nuclear power when basically all that ensures it's, is its isolation. But there are many other people in Iran who don't see it that way. So the question is whether this deal can help the Javed Zarifs, whether it can help Iran gain an understanding that it can achieve more power by being uh, attached to the global system than being detached and being a, uh, a minor nuclear country. Hard to say what's going to happen. But I submit to you that's not what the Saudis were thinking. The Saudis weren't thinking, well, gee, we're kind of worried. I mean, what are the, uh, what are the uh, provisions for the highly enriched uranium? Are they really going to have adequate verification of whether, you know, that's not what the Iranians were thinking. What the Iranians were thinking is that America used to be close buddies with these Iranians. Back in the 70s, they loved everything the Iranians were doing under the Shah, and now they're going back to that old dance partner and they're leaving us alone on the dance floor. That is what the Saudis are worried about, that we have somehow rekindled a relationship with the Iranians and left the Saudis out in the cold. So the administration has tried to you know, assure and reassure the Saudis over and over again that that is not the case. You recall uh, when uh, King Abdullah uh, died and uh, King Salman uh, uh, ascended to the throne, uh, President Obama cut short his trip to India to bring a very high level and I think very significantly and pretty rare uh, bipartisan delegation to Riyadh to, to be with the Saudis and show them that we really do care about their future. The president, I think, uh, by going there a couple of days from now is also, or tomorrow actually, is, is also trying to show the Saudis that just because we have calmed down this Iran issue with nuclear weapons uh, doesn't mean we're switching partners. You are still our mainstay in the region. And the president is saying this when he knows that the Saudis continue to be a source of the problem in the Middle East. And so I think that the new president is going to have to look very carefully about what we can do, if anything, with, with Iran, with, um, with Saudi Arabia, and what we can do to make sure that we get a coalition of Sunni Arab, and that's all they are. I mean, they're the only Shia Arab country here is, um, is Iraq. We need Sunni Arabs to be fighting this Sunni extremist, extremism known as ISIS. And so far, although the administration talks about this broad coalition of Arab states, if you look very carefully, you got the Jordanians in there, you got a couple others, you don't have the Saudis there, they haven't been there in months. And so it's very important that we try to get them involved and try to ultimately marginalize, cut off, and kill the, uh, this uh, ISIS uh, group. You know, as a, um, as a diplomat, I always look for the negotiation in something. There's no negotiation with ISIS. It is a brutal business that we have to be very clear about and very strong about dealing with. I think, frankly, the administration has handled it well. I don't think we should be putting in battle formations so that instead of talking about the Shia, they're talking about us. They're already talking about us. It would be a lot worse if we were in there in, um, in the open that way. I think the way we've done it with these special operators who are helping these various Kurdish groups deal with various uh, groups in uh, various uh, Shia militia, et cetera. Even some Sunnis have joined the fight in, the, in Syria. I think we need to um, t 
to continue with more of that because I think it's the right strategy. Finally, let me say a word about Syria. Syria is one of the most complex and desperately d difficult uh, places in the world. I would argue it is a place that we did not understand. We thought that uh, when uh, there were these this uprising against Assad, we thought that uh, people were rising up against Assad because he's uh, an autocratic dictator. And you remember the, our government uh, was considered a little too slow in dealing with uh, in dealing with Mubarak. And so, remember all the criticism in the New York Times. You know, why doesn't the the um, uh, Obama administration understand that this guy's toast, he's history, we need to move on, we need to support the uh, opposition in Egypt. So I think some of this criticism, especially liberal criticism against uh, the administration, caused the administration to compound the problem by making another big mistake, and that was to be a little too quick to jettison Assad. Assad is a hideous uh, figure. He's not the same kind of uh, person that Mubarak was. He never did us any help anywhere. Mubarak, you know, was rolling up terrorists for the last 30 years at our behest. But I think we thought it would be a cheap shot. That is, we thought, you know, there are two, I would say there are two huge American intelligence failures in the Middle East. One was the one we all know, which was the idea that Saddam had nuclear weapons, and of course he didn't. The second intelligence failure was the idea that Assad was going to be gone in a matter of weeks. He'd be a, not like another one of these dictators, whether it was, uh, you know, Assad, um, uh, Gaddafi or whoever. The structure of Syria is a lot more complex. The structure of Assad's power is a lot more cons uh, complex than to just say he's from a minority group known as the Alawites, who are 15 percent. He is, and that's where the, his power base is. But the Syrian Christians are with him. The Syrian Kurds have been with him, albeit for their own reasons. The Syrian Druze have been with him. And frankly, a lot of the Syrian Sunnis, who are not Islamicized, who are much more uh, on the secular side, they've also been with them. All this is to say that it's far more complex than people suggest. And the only thing I think we, sh rather than try to give more weapons to people on the battlefield, I think there are plenty of weapons in Syria. I think there are enough weapons in Syria. But I think we need to do a much better job of laying out what could be the political arrangements for that country where people could learn to live together. Um, you know, this is the 20th anniversary, 21st anniversary now of the Dayton Peace Accords in Bosnia uh, that uh, Joe very kindly mentioned that I was in, involved in. What was important about Dayton was that we knew that the war would eventually end, and the question was, how, do people, how are people going to live together? So you put together political arrangements. Uh, you create, you, you try to, you come up with a plan. Should it be within its existing borders? I'd say yes on Bosnia and yes on Syria. Should um, uh, Bosnia have been a uh, uh, kind of confederal or federal state rather than a unitary state? That was true of Bosnia. I think it's true of Syria. Should uh, there be um, uh, self-rule in these places, right of taxation collection, et cetera? That was true in Bosnia. I think it's even more true in Syria. Uh, in short, can you fashion a government model besides simple um, majority rule in Syria? Because majority rule has not been what has worked in Syria. What works in Syria, what has worked in most recent years is dictatorship, but what could work conceivably is a much more decentralized structure where people, where the rights of the minority are uh, are understood, and there are many minorities in, in Syria. So, you know, a lot of these dictators, they learn the first rule of democracy, which is majority rule. Putin has certainly done that in Russia. Putin is, could win an election today in Russia. But what they have not learned is the second rule, which is how you make the minorities comfortable with the majority. In the case of Syria, you need arrangements that make those Alawites and, and Druze and Kurds, et cetera, feel that they can have a life there without being oppressed by the central government. What's uh, the problem in, in Russia is Putin needs to accept political opposition, political minorities. They are minorities. Maybe they could become a majority. Um, and so uh, 
This idea that democracy is only about majority rule really misses page two of democracy. You know, mentioning Putin, just real quick, because I think we're about done here, but uh, I would like to say that is another long-term challenge. And again, to mention what I said about, uh, about um, China, the problem of Russia is not that it's gaining strength or, gain, or going to be strong. Look at its economy. Look at its demography. Russia is a weakening country. But as I said about China, if it's a weakening superpower, it can be a dangerous superpower. And we need to be vigilant. We need to understand that NATO is not just a croquet club. NATO needs to have serious uh, power behind it. Countries like Poland are happy to be in NATO. They want some sign that NATO's in them. And so we do need to be carefully, uh, judiciously moving force structure eastward, not in a way to frighten the Russians, but certainly in a way to make clear that those countries are countries that we would be prepared to go to war for were that hideous eventuality to happen. So we have a lot of work to do on all of these issues. And I just hope our new president is up to this. So we'll see. I spent uh, time in Libya in the 1950s and 1960s. Oil was the big deal. Yeah. And King Idris was the, the uh, man in charge, and he was very benign sort of a guy. Then. Gaddafi took over, created the problem that has not subsequently been, been yeah. satisfied. So I don't know. What do you think is going to happen in Libya? I think they're going to go through, first of all, I think there's a concept of Libya. I don't think it needs to break apart. It's a weak concept, weakened by uh, Gaddafi, to be sure. Um, but I think there's a concept of being Libyan. We live in a very sectarian, a very tribal age. So I think those forces are going to be stronger than that state concept of being Libyan. But I don't think that has to be the situation for the rest of history. And uh, my own sense is it's going to be a mess um, for a few years. But ultimately, it will come around to some kind of uh, you know, benign, um, maybe, even, uh, roy or maybe even royalty, but some concept to hold the state together with more modern governance structures that allow people to live their lives in peace. And, they do, they do, but they're not going to go back to Libya until there's security. And you know, for all the people who advocate war, who think that's a solution to everything, you know, show me a war and I'll show you refugees. So people who stand up and call for war, I, I call for them to house a refugee family in their living room. I would start with that. Um, just, just drives me crazy. I mean, it is the nastiest way. I mean. You know, I saw this in the Balkans. I mean, it, it ruins lives. It ruins countries. It's a terrible way to solve things. And when I hear people who otherwise consider themselves very civilized saying, well, we've g given it every try, or then to suggest that we should be sending troops as, as anything besides a terrible last resort, simply they, they don't understand what, it's, uh, what it involves. It just drives me nuts. So, Next question here, yeah, then we'll yeah. get that. Yeah. Now, if we defeat ISIS, what happens to the land? Does the, does the Sunni land in Syria yeah. go back to Assad? Does the Sunni land in Iraq go yeah. back to the Shia government in Iraq? What happens to the land that ISIS Well, I think uh, ISIS is mainly uh, inhabiting Sunni lands. That is, lands owned by Sunnis, traditional Sunnis. You know, remember when ISIS was... Uh, in its ascendancy, and there was all this concern, oh, they're going to take Baghdad. Uh, no, they were never going to take Baghdad. Uh, the issue is whether Shia, on behalf of the Iraqi state, are prepared to fight to liberate Sunni lands. And that's been the problem. The, and when you see, when people say, oh, the Iraqi army is terrible, yeah, the morale is terrible because Shia don't want to be liberating Sunni lands for a problem that they believe the Sunnis created. So um, as your question implies, this is going to be difficult. But I think the Shia, largely Shia forces or Shia composition of the Iraqi army is incentivized to take back the second largest city of Iraq, Mosul. I think they are incentivized. Um, but they're going to need help from various Sunni groups. And the Sunnis are going to have to be very clear that uh, they may not like the Shia, but uh, uh, 
the Shia are far better than ISIS. So uh, I think a lot of what needs to happen is uh, the Sunnis need to come to this, re uh, this uh, understanding. And I do believe that the problem of uh, Iraq has been more of Sunni rejectionism than of the failure of Shia outreach. Uh, I don't know if I should say ambassador or dean, uh, but uh, call me Chris. It's <laughs> but um, um, there currently, apparently, there are 28 pages that were classified in the 9/11 yeah. commission, yeah. and now there's some sort of joint yeah. uh, congressional action to try and get this declassified. I wonder if you could give us any insight into, you know, our relationship with Saudi Arabia relative yeah. to 9/11. I don't know what it is. I suspect it gives some, uh, at least results of investigations that have suggested that Saudi institutions, maybe not the Saudi family, but maybe some of these so-called non-governmental institutions in Saudi Arabia have been part and parcel uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the uh, conduit of, of money to radical Sunni groups, probably something along those lines. I think it's wanted in the lawsuits uh, to suggest that the Saudis' royal family or the Saudi government, which is kind of synonymous with the royal family, it was inadequate in its efforts to uh, stem the flow of terrorist financing. And so I think that's the, uh, that's the rub on this. I don't know. I have no way of evaluating whether it's evidence or not. I suspect it's put in the, I, I suspect that investigators have kind of done this reporting and that if you're a plaintiff in this suit, it would be pretty powerful material to use in the courts to suggest that we, they should have the right to sue the Saudi uh, royal family, which, by the way, is where the money is. So. We're on this side now. Good evening. Thanks for being here and for the, the good information. It, it seems to me that when you're trying to solve a problem, you have to define it. Otherwise, you flail away in all parts of the world. Uh, my problem is I've heard elected officials, appointed officials uh, for years talk about national interests. And for the life of me, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah. Can you explain that so that all of us in the United States know what we're trying to do? Well, I mean, we have an, we have an interest in a um, stable and uh, successful you know, our allies, we don't want our allies to be at war because if they're at war, we're at war. We want a stable and successful Europe, for example. Europe is not going to be stable and, su and successful without um, uh, a uh, supply of Middle East oil. And for all the talk of non-traditional oil and gas sector in the U.S., uh, oil from Saudi Arabia and, uh, and other uh, these uh, uh, Arab Peninsula or Gulf states, is, is essential to the world economy. So I think our interests are in a stable world economy. Now, I don't know if you're getting at this, but I'll put it out there, which is that there are a lot of people who say, well, our interest is in spreading democracy because democracy, after all, is the most stable form of government. And so if, if a government has democracy, it'll be stable and then we, we can trade with them and everything's fine. So. I understand the logic of that. That, however, has turned into an, an issue where if a country is not democratic, even if it's stable, we go after that country and uh, you know wag our finger, wag our fist, and poke them with a bayonet until they come around to our view of what governmental structure should exist uh, in their country. And I wish everyone, heck, I wish everyone were a baseball fan, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, that would, that would help. But I don't think you can force people to do things. And so I think what happened is we got a whole sort of democracy industry in this country where we think our job is to go out, first of all, we rank the countries, you know, like a teacher, we oh, well, is a D minus, you know, uh, uh, you know, clearly need some improvement there. So we rank these countries and we go after them. And I understand, but, you know, I, I, and I understand that the more democratic, the more stable a country is. But I'm approaching it much more from a pragmatic 
are they going in the right direction stability-wise than the other direction? And I just think we'd be, we have to be a little careful of this sort of secular, uh, you know, missionary type stuff. Uh, you know, um, I mean, there are plenty of missionaries who've gone out and tried to get people to accept Christ, but, you know, certainly not in the last uh, century have they gone out with a bayonet to do that. So uh, I, I think we have to, as a country, we have to kind of dial that down a bit. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, often if you say that, you know, people say, what, you don't believe in our values? Yes, I do. Uh, and I think our values are very good. Oh, you know, overall, I won't speak for every presidential candidate right now, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think our values are, are very good. But I think you lead by example. And, uh, and I think we could do a lot better job leading by example. And then if people ask for our help, you bet we ought to be there. But I, I have found as, you know, I was trying to get, it was in my smallest post, I was ambassador in a little place called Macedonia, and, you know, and I was trying to get them to, um, to uh, uh, allow the Albanians to speak uh, Albanian in the schools or have that as the language in the schools in towns in which there was an Albanian majority. And, you know, in little Macedonia, you have this language called Macedonian, which is part of the sort of... Uh, identity of being Macedonia, that you speak the language. So they're worried about, well, they'll have Albanians who only speak Albanian. Pretty soon they won't have any sense of being a citizen of, of Macedonia. Not an easy thing for them. But I got all these people back in Washington saying, you know, we've just heard from these groups that the Macedonian government is refusing to introduce more. You know, and so it's a kind of a tough situation. Um, but, you know, I go to the prime minister, and I'd worked with him on a lot of things. And I said, look, I need some help on this. And, uh, you know, he looked at it. He went through the whole thing to me again about, you know, what I just explained, but he took about three hours. And then, uh, and then he said, but, you know, I'm going to do it. And you know why I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it because I value the relationship with the U.S. And I know if I don't do this, the relationship with the U.S. is going to not be very good. So I'm going to do it because I value the relationship. And he did it. And so I, I think... There are times when, you know, you can get to that point, but that involved me doing a lot of good things for him, you know, for his country, such that he understood, all right, you know, you don't really understand what you're talking about, but we'll do it anyway because I care about you. And so this idea, you know, and the worst thing, read a New York Times editorial someday. I mean, they just... I mean, most people don't, but read one. And, uh, you know, they go on and on. I mean, one time I was in Iraq, and there, there was, you know, what we must do in Iraq. That was the first must. And I, carry, I counted 11 more of them in the single editorial. Then we must tell them this and must insist on that and must. You know, I mean, I, I doubt the New York Times gets, you know, their you know, reporters to do things by saying you must. Uh, and so I, I think. You know, we just need to dial it down. There are times when you just have to go in there and give them hell, believe me. But there are other times where you better save your ammunition for the important times. So. Yes. Yes, it seems that from all of our intervention that the Kurds have been the only ones who perhaps have been successful in, in controlling an area. Yeah. Is there any possibility that the breakdowns could occur that, I don't suppose these countries can come apart, but that yeah. could be um, based more, less on lines and more on their own particular interests. Yeah. I, look, I think um, the, uh, I would give, I would assign a probability of much greater than zero that the Kurds form an independent state at some point. But if we said, if you do it, we'll recognize you, it would have been done. But I think the US and other countries don't think this is a good idea, uh, think this would cause even more problems with the Arab world, and think that um, they were not just the Arab world, the Turkish world, the Iranians, et cetera. And so the US has not supported this. And so while if you have any Kurd you talk to, I mean, I know the Kurds in Iraq, but I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Any Kurd you talk to, they want to be independent. But they, uh, they've had pretty wise leadership on this issue. And I think their leadership has understood that, you know, you can declare, you know, you can declare this country club an independent state, 
but it only matters if other people recognize you as an independent state. And so I think the Kurds have understood that better than some of these counties in Colorado, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, but um, you know, it's just not in the cards until we and other countries say it's in the cards. Uh, and so I, 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 you know, if you go from the Arab lands to the Kurdish lands, you go through checkpoints now. You go, um, you know, it looks like an international border. But, you know, if you go from East Kurdistan, I'm sorry, West Kurdistan um, to Eastern Kurdistan, that is from Erbil to Sulaymaniyya, you also go through a border, and that's because they're rival Kurdish factions. So often these, you'd be a little careful about the idea, well, if they're just all together in the same place, they'd be happy. You know, um, this problem of self and other can be uh, very powerful. We've got another question here, and then yeah. we're going to get to the other side. We've got several hands up over there. Okay. This is a simple question. Uh, when in Iraq, when you were uh, paying off, uh, various people to... I wasn't uh, paying them no, off. Okay. What when, we're doing, when, when, we're giving when, when funds, money, funds to run being, these militia groups. Right. When funds were, funds, when funds were being transferred yes. uh, at that time, what currency did you use? Well, the funds were being transferred by the uh, Iraqi army and uh, or by the Iraqi Ministry of Finance. That was all Iraqi dinars, um, which did have a, an exchange rate. Uh, but the uh, earlier funds where the U.S. was handing out money, that was often just plain old dollars. Yeah. I'm trying to get all the way over here on the other side. I'll start here and work our way towards the middle because I've seen several hands that way. Uh, with the Saudi 9-11 uh, lawsuit that seems to be pending, are we opening ourselves up to um, a lot of liability here, I mean, the collateral, collateral fatalities with drone strikes and on and on and on? Yeah, I, I think uh, suing, suing. I, I'm not a lawyer, but my suspicion is you're absolutely right. And I, I also suspect that a lot of the uh, opposition to this type of lawsuit is based on the idea that it could uh, redound to, uh, to our, you know, create problems for us. I, I think you're absolutely right. Just a little closer to home, uh, Venezuela, perhaps Brazil. <laughs> I. Uh, who's going to? You're going there. Tomorrow. Joe's going to Brazil, and when are you coming back? So on the 12th of May, why don't you? Have him? <laughs> uh, I I have the sense that uh, well, if oil prices recover, I think Venezuela could recover politically, but I think it's very difficult right now. Uh, and uh, Brazil, I think this is a very deep-seated problem of, uh, of governmental structures, and uh, I think it's going to be a deepening political crisis for a while. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was really excellent. Um, i ask you to look into the future a little bit here with your profession. What difference is it going to make for the world and for international diplomacy when we have our first woman president and more women in leadership roles? How do you envision that's going to change the dynamics of the future of the world? You know, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm, uh, I feel the advent of a, of a woman president in this country um, I, I don't see a big change. I, I see change from a uh, you know maybe a political perspective. She may do things differently from Obama, but I I don't think that uh, it would change. I mean, when I talk to my I have two daughters, uh, they're twenties, and uh, you know they don't really see this issue. It's funny they don't see the historical aspect of first woman president. They don't see it at all. And I'm not sure what that really means. I've asked them. And I think it just means, as Wall Street would say, it's discounted news. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the market's already adjusted for it. So, I mean, I, I was in uh, Korea when Park Geun-hye took over. She's, uh, you know, a lot of people said Korea will never have a woman president, you know, not till the 23rd century or something. And, and Park Geun-hye came in, and, you know, she's 
She's had her political problems like everyone else, but I, I don't see any change within Korea of what should had truly have been a, uh, a historical. Uh, I mean, if you were to bet who would have a woman president sooner, the United States or the Koreans, you you know, never would have bet on the Koreans. So, uh, I I I like to think that it's um, it's kind of discounted news, and I don't think we need to worry about any cataclysmic uh, change. And uh, I remember I was I was at this Dayton Peace Accords uh, thing a few months ago, 20th anniversary, and. Uh, and someone got up and complained that, uh, you know, if, if only we had had more women at the negotiating table, there would have been a different outcome. And I, you know, I mean, first of all, I, I said, well, how do you mean that? You know, come on, be specific. And, you know, and, and there wasn't any specificity to it. And I was thinking, you know, what if Milovana Plavcic, to take one of the war, war criminals from Bosnia and Serbia, what if she had been there? I don't think that would have helped at all. So I, I, I think this kind of stuff has been absorbed. But then finally, I'll just say, you know, like the old line, remember the old line where Nixon asked Joe and Lai, uh, what's the significance of the French Revolution? And, uh, and uh, Joe and Lai said to him, it's too early to tell. And so I, <laughs> I, 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 maybe that's the really honest answer of whether a woman president could have kind of underlying change. and. Uh, things that uh, I'm certainly not anticipating right now. And by the way, uh, the last few secretaries of state, I mean, with, you know, before John Kerry, I mean, with three, three out of four women, and the, the, the man was an African-American, which was also groundbreaking. And, and I don't remember thinking it was different because, you know, Condi was there or, you know, um, or, you know, Madeleine Albright. A number of years ago, we had a speaker who ended the evening by saying that he had a good understanding of war and what that universe is like, but he couldn't envision peace. He didn't know how to define that. So I thought maybe you'd take a little time to talk about what peace would look like so we might have a vision to work toward. Well, I think, I think no peace question. is... Uh... You know, I mean, I could cop out on that and say it's the absence of war. But uh, I think it's really having enough uh, respect for others and the way others think that you, and you understand you kind of have to meet people halfway because if you insist on everything, uh, you'll sooner or later meet someone else who insists on everything, and that's where violence occurs. So I, I like to think, for me, peace is, is you know, people who have a, respect for the opinions of others. And, uh, and I think that's, um, that's what diplomacy is all about. You, you know, if you go in there and try to get everything you want, which is, believe me, I always did. I mean, uh, and, and you know, you got some person back there saying he wasn't tough enough. Well, you know, you try it sometime, uh, you know. Um, so I think it's a, it's a question of, uh, you know, holding certain values, but looking for how you can incorporate the other perspective in it. I mean, that's to me what, uh, uh, Mary, I'm going to say to you, conflict resolution is about. I, you know, uh, <laughs> Mary doesn't need a lecture on conflict <laughs> resolution. She gives many of them. But I, I, seriously, I think that's what we have to do is just have a little more uh, decent respect for the opinions of others. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to. Uh, Thank you. Could you comment on the European Union, Islamic terrorism there, and potential yeah. British exit from the European yeah. Union? I think the European Union has gone through great problems. Um, I thought the problems would have been accepting countries that didn't have rich democratic traditions from the East and bringing them in. And it turned out to be a problem more with the southern tier. And I think there were a lot of people who thought the European Union was done at that point. But I think they managed. And I think they managed because I think every European, more so than Americans, Europeans understand the ravages of war. And, uh, and they know that the European Union, for all the talk about you know the German-French uh, coal and steel agreement and all of that, you know, stuff. What the European Union really was about was 
tying the countries together in webs of relations such that war was, was not an option. And so I think the current leadership of the European Union understood that this is their historical task to keep this anti-war machine running. And so um, to do it, it requires far more patience than the average American can muster. I mean, I tell you, you sit there, you listen to these people talk and talk, and then they're going off to another meeting and some other group of uh, configuration of countries where they're going to talk and talk, and you wonder how do you do it, and you do it because this is how you prevent war. I mean, I'm preventing, I'm, that's, it, deep down, that's what they think they're doing. So, um, so that's why I think there's a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, a lot of uh, resiliency in the European Union. Now, the question of their handling of terrorism. First of all, I just felt it was really bad form on the day that these terrorists brutalize, murder all these people in Belgium. You have all these American uh, commentators saying, well, you know, the Belgians don't know how to handle this, and gee, if they, only they'd listened to us, it would have been better. That's not how I treat a friend. I mean, when something like that happens, you don't give them a lecture that day. Um, but I think um, that said, I think probably they do have to step up the, the, uh, the pace in terms of uh, figuring out how to manage these people from their near abroad. And they have a bigger task than we do. Uh, and, uh, you know, the problem of terrorism is, you know, um, they can hit you anywhere and you can only protect certain parts. It's not easy to, to protect everything when, you know, if you're trying to protect a balloon and, and they can just prick it with a pin anywhere, it's not easy. And it does require uh, some judicious management of individual liberties and stuff like that, things that Americans feel that we can do. Europeans, because of this delicate project of European democracy, uh, have, uh, have been a little less willing to do. I think they're going to do more. And frankly, I think the Belgian police did a lot. And, you know, they, they didn't succeed, but that was not a time to be, you know, slamming them behind their backs. And that's what went on in this country. Uh, you know, it could happen to us tomorrow. And do you really want the Europeans say, well, only the Americans, uh, you know, did this or that. Uh, so it's, this is a very tough thing we're in. Finally, on the Brexit, on the Brexit issue, I think uh, Britain's relationship with the European Union is, is different. It came in more for the economy than for this foundational project of being the anti-war machine. It, they came in on a later stage, the sense that if they're left out, they're left out of decision making, they're left out of economic uh, well-being, et cetera. Some of those things are being re-looked at in, in Britain. Uh, it strikes me it's a little like the Scottish referendum. I have the, I, I still believe at the end of the day the Brits will stay in, but you know you heard it here first, folks. But I could be dead wrong about it. We have two final questions. We are at nine o'clock. We're going over a little. Yeah. I wonder if we could ask your permission to combine these two questions briefly. Sure. Just help me with the first one because I can't remember. <laughs> <the other. laughs> yeah. First, first question, Mr. Ambassador, what, uh, what does the new oil price paradigm do to power balances and to world diplomacy? I, I think whether we admit it or not, it makes us a little less, interest in the, less interested in the Middle East. So I think, that, I think it does make a difference. I think it makes uh, the Arab world a little poorer. And even though they've squandered the oil to date, they at least had the hope of not squandering it. But uh, I think they're going to have trouble buying off the oppositions as they've done over the – buying off the terrorists and things like that. So um, you can look at it from another point of view that if they, uh, if they don't have the money, maybe they'll spend it more wisely. But I, I just don't see a lot of evidence to support that. So I think it's going to make us less interested, and I think it's going to sharpen the choices and make life more difficult for them. And our final question. Yeah. So I know this is pretty personal for you because – I was here the last time you spoke, but was there any, have there been any significant changes that have improved the ambassadorial situation in other countries so we won't have a repeat of the Benghazi situation? You know, I, uh, um, when I was in Iraq, I had a security 
guy named Derek De La Cruz. And I always had these ideas. I'd say, Derek, uh, let's go to Basra. Where there's a, this event, that event. Let's go to Basra. Let's spend two nights in Basra. And uh, Derek would say, great idea, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the problem is, I said, what's the problem, Derek? There's no problem in Basra. The problem is, sir, we can't protect you uh, through the night. It's very difficult for us. So we have a certain number of agents, certain number, amount of equipment. Can we go there for the day? You do whatever you need to do, and if you can't do everything, go back to Baghdad and come back the next day. And I always took Derek's, Derek's advice on this. I, I would like to know the nature of the conversations that went on in Tripoli on that. And so what I don't want to see is Washington telling ambassadors what part of the country they can go visit. I mean, it's the one fun thing being an ambassador. You know, it's your peanut stand. You go wherever you want. You know, and uh, and I wouldn't want some you know bureaucrat back in Washington saying, "Well, we've read a report of of uh, threats in Basra. Therefore, we don't want you to go visit Basra." You know, let me be the judge of that report. And if you haven't shared it to me, shame on you. And so, uh, but I think ambassadors need to realize that it's not about them. It's about our country. And, uh, and so we carry a heavy burden in that regard, and I think we need to be extremely careful and manage risk. Thank you very much, Ambassador okay. Hill. Thank you.